Good morning, dear students. This lecture will be a histology recapitulation. I, on the example of a few slides in the second half of the lecture, I will show you examples about the general buildup of tissues, and I will also show you the same pictures what I showed you in the initial lecture to explain the general buildup of tissues. First of all, you have to know that we have four basic tissues. This theory was established in the 19th century, and these four basic tissues are the epithelial tissues, the connective and supportive tissues, the muscle tissue, and the nervous tissue. And the sequence is important because this is how they are connected to each other. On the surface, we have always epithelia, underneath always connective tissue, deeper we may have muscle, and the nervous tissue may enter all these tissues. Some, there are some tissues which show transitional characteristics. What does this mean? That we connect these basic tissues with, uh, with uh, some uh, specification, what we uh, are accustomed to it, like epithelia are on the surface, connective tissue may be sometimes tenser, like the tendons, but many times they are loose, so they connect something. Uh, the muscle tissues, they contract. But we have some special cells, special tissues, like smooth muscle cells occasionally may produce fibers. You saw it in the aorta, for example, that the elastic fibers were produced not by fibrocytes there, but by smooth muscle cells. Or in the scar tissue, we mentioned that fibrocytes may occasionally have contractile elements, actin and myosin filaments, and then we call them myofibroblasts. These are important for wound healing. And around the, uh, the glands, we may have so-called myoepithelial cells. These may also contract. They also contain actin and myosin filaments. Here you see them on an Eisenstein picture around a, a odoriferous gland. And these are epithelial cells. If we would show the intermediate filaments, those were cytokeratin, which is characteristic for epithelium, but they can contract. So these are some specialties which, are, which show some transitional features between these four basic tissues. The nervous tissue uh, has some common features with the epithelial tissues. What is this? That with epithelial cells, uh, we know that they have an apical and a basolateral surface, and these surfaces have uh, uh, different functions. And in the case of nervous tissue and the nerve cells, we have the dendrites, which pick up the information, or the soma picks up the information, and the depolarization is always going in the direction of the telodendron distally from the soma of the, of the uh, nerve cell. So those are also polarized cells. Here you see that what are the intermediate filaments in different type of tissues. This might have importance, for example, in pathology, uh, when they do pathohistology on tumors and they want to find out that from which type of tissue it originated, sometimes they have to use immunocytochemical staining for these intermediate filaments. <coughs> now I will show you a series of pictures which you might think that what does it have to do with histology. So think about a child that we show a Yorkshire Terrier for a child and we say that this is a dog. Uh, and then maybe that the child who has never seen a dog yet before, next day sees another dog and we, and we doesn't realize that this is a dog. But if we show the child a few other types of dogs, then after a while, the child will draw the conclusion that all bark and swing their tails, and these are all dogs, although they look different. Why do I tell this? Uh, because in this semester, due to the online teaching and the scanned slides, uh, you didn't have the chance to see a few types of tissues from the uh, types of specimen from the same type of tissue. In the next semester, when we, we will go to the organs, it might be uh, that, uh, for example, with the tongue tissues or, or small intestine tissues, that your neighbor in the class will have an other, a slide from another tissue block, and that might look differently on the first side. But if you examine it, you will, you will, have, to, uh, uh, ex uh, you will have to realize that this has the, all have the same common features. And we wouldn't like you to, uh, to, uh, you to be trained only for one appearance of that particular organ. We would like that you would uh, uh, be able to recognize any specimen from that particular organ uh, in your life. So in the next semester, this will be important, that you will have to compare uh, the slides with each other 
from, from the same organ. Now, these drawings I showed you at the beginning uh, of this semester in the first lecture, but I bet and I hope that, that you are now much more clever and you know a lot more about histology, and now it will make maybe a little more sense. So please go through these slides. The basics of histology is in these slides, and if you understand this, then you can answer a lot of questions which you may get in the exam. The surfaces are always covered with epithelia, and these may be squamous, cuboidal, columnar, or even stratified. Uh, this depends always on the function. If, it, if you need diffusion, then you will have a simple squamous epithelium. If the cells have some specific functions, then more cytoplasm will appear. And the, in the cytoplasm, of course, there are the cell organelles, which then, uh, then do the job, what they have to do in that particular organ. If we also need mechanical or sometimes osmotic uh, protection, then, the, then the, the tissue, these uh, surface epithelia, they might be stratified. If you need also protection against drying out, like on your sur body surface, you have a stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium because the keratin will prevent the evaporation and you will not dry out, and that's a very important thing. So please remember that no cell keeps up cytoplasm without function. And think about it when you see a cell and you, you think about a tissue that why does that cell look like that? Under the epithelia, we have always a basement membrane. This basement membrane consists always of a lamina basalis and a fibroreticular layer. The fibroreticular layer contains reticular fibers, as the name suggests, and uh, that's also a type of collagen. Now you know that that's collagen type 3. And in the lamina basalis, we have a membrane-forming protein, which is a collagen again, and that's the collagen type 4. Uh, the, the, this basement membrane is very important for the growth of tumors. So if a tumor is growing and breaks through the, uh, the basement membrane, that's already a more serious case. It's an important thing to know about that. The cells are encored to each other with junctional complexes. You have learned about those in biology and you have to know it in the histo exam also, that we have the tight junctions, uh, then we have the, uh, the zonula adherens, then we have the desmosomes, then we have the uh, hemidesmosomes, we have the gap junctions. You must know about these possibilities. To the surface, we may have glands opening. These glands always develop from the surface. So imagine like if I would push in this epithelium, and of course the glands are also surrounded by the basement membrane. Under the epithelia we have always connective tissue, no exception. Next layer is always a connective tissue. Uh, all connective tissues are built up from cells, fibers, and amorphous ground substance. Uh, here on this schematic drawing I represented the three cell, uh, fiber types. The collagen fibers are typically shown with thicker pink lines. Uh, the elastic fibers are more eosinophilic and they are usually drawn like wavy lines because that's the, a typical appearance also in the slide of this. And the straight thin bulk lines, they represent the reticular fibers, uh, reflecting that they are so-called argyrophilic fibers. They may be stained with silver nitrate. Uh, in this slide, I show you the cells. Although the cells are the most important elements of the connective tissue, always, even if we have only a few of them, uh, because these produce the intracellular matrix, uh, for didactical reasons, it was easier to draw first, I drew the fibers. And in the spaces, now I drew here the, uh, the cells. Uh, we have fixed and mobile, or wandering, connective tissue cells. The fixed cells uh, may move minimally. In the, in the loose connective tissue. So they are not frozen forever, but they cannot migrate a lot. And these uh, cells are the fibrocytes, fibroblasts. You know that these are the same cell, just two activity stages. Again, it's shown that the active cell has more cytoplasm. Uh, adipocytes, these are here, adipocytes, and mesenchymal stem cells. The mesenchymal stem cells we cannot identify in our uh, slides. So for that, we would need special techniques. The mobile cells, are, uh, all of them are born in the uh, red bone marrow and they travel with the bloodstream. And they step out on the spot where they have to do their job, they do their job, and usually in a few days they will die off. A few of them will remain, they belong to the immune system, uh, like memory cells, 
and sometimes the lymphocytes may turn into plasma cells and plasma cells may appear also sometimes in the connective tissues. These are cells which produce the antibodies. Uh, it's a tradition that uh, when we teach the connective tissue cells, the loose connective tissue cells, uh, then we also show you the melanocytes. In this year you saw the melanocytes from the choroid layer of the eye and we mentioned that they might be present also in the stratified squamous keratinizing, occasionally also in the non-keratinizing epithelium, for example in the oral cavity, uh, between the basal cells. Right? So the, in the skin you have the melanocytes sitting in the epithelium in the basal cells next to the basement membrane. Uh, but sometimes the, these melanocytes, uh, they are in the connective tissue. If in your skin they are in, in the connective tissue, uh, they, they are sh shown as, as, uh, as uh, uh, bluish spots. But uh, uh, as I told you, in this semester you saw the melanocytes from the choroid layer of the eye, there it's absolutely normal that, that they are in the, in the uh, connective tissue and we have the luck also there that the entire melanocyte contains uh, melanin granules and you could see these big cells with the long uh, processes. Now these melanocytes uh, are derived from the neural crest and they are very special cells, usually the books they don't uh, tell that to which basic tissue they belong to. Uh, all these fibers and the cells are embedded into the amorphous ground substance, which may be hyaluronic acid, lycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and cell adhesion uh, molecules like the glycoproteins. They belong to the glycoproteins. Uh, more about this you must know from the lecture material and from your textbooks. The fat cells are also special cells. The ones, it's very good for us that we know that fat cells are around 100 micrometer big because we can relate other structures to their uh, sizes. And the fat cells, they have also a basement membrane on the surface. Uh, and uh, also the brown fat cells have this basement membrane on the surface. These are the only connective tissue cells this, which have a, a basement membrane on their surface. Uh, when you do the normal dissecting, which you couldn't do in this semester, then your job is mostly to remove the loose connective tissue from in between the other structures. So you remove the, uh, the loose connective tissue along the vessels and on the nerves and between the muscle compartments. You remove also the fascias from the muscles to see the muscles. So that's, uh, that's the dissecting and with this sometimes you have an a, a false imagination that connective tissues are not that important. But these are, this is a very important compartment of our body, the connective tissues, the loose connective tissues, because they are reservoir for, for ions and for water. So if you, are, if you don't have an immediate access to, the, to water, then your blood will drain some water from the connective tissues, and that's not a, a, a mistake that the, that the normal glasses are around 250-300 uh, uh, milliliter volume because that's when we feel that we need to drink and we drink that much and then it again uh, refills uh, the, these reservoirs and you have again a capacity to, uh, to not to drink for a few hours. So you don't have to sip all the time from the bottle because you can drink or it's enough if you drink once an hour or in every two hours. Uh, well, so the connective tissues are important from this aspect and uh, the connective tissues, any kind of them, also the dense connective tissues of course, they contain a lot of collagen and collagen is not a very tasty material if you, if you think about buying meat or buying food, uh, but uh, it's a very important uh, element of your body and about 25% of your body protein, that's collagen. So when you kill an animal for uh, nutrition that you want to make food from, the, from that animal, you cannot waste 25% of, of this uh, protein. So uh, either the, your, your uh, uh, culture or today the industry will make you eat that collagen in, in a certain form. And this may be the jelly, which in Hungary in the winter time it's a very uh, very well-known food type. Usually you don't like it because you think that it's something not, not very 
uh, tasty. It's, it's, it can be very, very tasty. Uh, or you get these cold cuts, you know, in these tubes, in these red plastic tubes, which look like rubber. It's not a mistake that it looks like rubber because it's about the same thing as the jelly, just in a, a, a different uh, shape. Uh, this uh, this uh, collagen that's also a glue. The carpenters in the ancient times, they used this material as to glue together two pieces of wood. So this glues together all, this, all that thing with, from which these cold cuts are made. Or if you think that you don't eat any of them, if you eat these candies, then think about that, that these are also made out of collagen with some food color. Okay, so in the, we have the epithelia, basement membrane, connective tissue, and in the deeper layers, we have always muscle tissue. This may be skeletal muscle. If you go through your forearm, then you go through the specific layers like the stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, the dermis, which is a dense irregular connective tissue, then the subcutaneous connective tissue, which has some fat cells also, and then you get to the muscle tissues. Or if you are in the, in the gut system, then also you have a surface epithelium underneath the connective tissue, and then comes the smooth muscle. In that case, of course, that's smooth muscle. Uh, in the kitchen, we call this skeletal muscle, we call it the meat. That's the meat in the kitchen. Uh, smooth muscle you rarely eat. Uh, it's, uh, it's the stomach of the beef that, uh, that people eat, and that's called then the tripe. Uh, and that has, there, there also the mucous membrane uh, is a part of this tripe, but a layer of that uh, tripe part pieces are, are, uh, is uh, the smooth muscle. If you have to distinguish these, uh, histologically, these uh, two muscle types, it's not that difficult because they differ a lot from each other in size. Uh, the skeletal muscle cells are around 100 micrometers, so they are about the size of the uh, fat cells in cross-section. And the smooth muscle cells are around the size of a lymphocyte. They may be also sometimes smaller, sometimes a little bit bigger, and the length varies. But the books, when they say that the length is between 20 or 50 micrometer up to 500 micrometer, take care because the 500 micrometer big smooth muscle cells exist only in the pregnant uterus, so it's not a common thing. Usually the smooth muscle cells are much smaller cells than 500 micrometer. Uh, both of them contain actin and myosin filament. For more details, go to the uh, lectures, please. And please note that the skeletal muscle fiber, we use this term, skeletal muscle fiber. Skeletal muscle fiber is a multinucleated giant cell. So please remember this, that in the case, we use the term fiber for many things, which is long and thin. So we used it for the uh, connective tissue fibers. We use it now for the, for the skeletal muscle fiber, which is actually a cell. And we will use also for the nerve fiber, which is a part of the nerve cell, the axon, and the sheath around it. So always think about it, that what do we, do we use this word for? And don't, it's not always extracellular matrix. The smooth muscle cells are also surrounded by uh, uh, lamina basalis. And the contractility in all cases is provided by actin and myosin filaments. Uh, between the smooth muscle cells and the skeletal muscle fibers, we have always a little connective tissue, more or less. This may be more or less, but there is always a little connective tissue. Here you see an example. On the surface here we have a transitional epithelium, and underneath this is a connective tissue here. And there you see these patches of smooth muscle. And between the smooth muscle uh, bundles, we have here connective tissue, uh, thicker and thinner septa. And even between the smooth muscle cells, we have a very, very little connective tissue that doesn't appeal very much on this small magnified uh, picture. Now, the vessels enter the connective tissue, and with that, they supply uh, the other elements. How do they do this? That they get close to the basement membrane, and through the basement membrane with diffusion, the epithelium will be uh, supplied, because we know that the epithelia are, are avascular. And uh, if, if we say that uh, the muscle, that uh, we used to say that the vessels, they also enter the muscle tissue, but actually uh, they enter with the connective tissue, the muscle tissue, so that they don't, uh, the muscle cells are never that much connected to each other. So between the muscle cells, you always have this little connective tissue, and this little connective tissue drives then 
the nerves and the, and the vessels to the actual muscle cells. Uh, and please note that in the, in the connective tissue we have the blood vessels, but when we talk about the connective tissue cells, then the, the, the endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells, which we find in the wall of the blood vessels, we do not list them with the cells of the connective tissue. So we know that vessels are there, but they are not constituents of the, of the connective tissue. Uh, in the uh, connective tissue and in the muscle tissue, we may also find nerves. On these, this picture, you see the motor nerves. They may be somatomotor nerves. They come from the ventral horn of the spinal cord. You must have learned about this in the microscopy. And the axon is going out and innervating, giving the motor innervation for skeletal muscles. Uh, fibers like this uh, are present in the median nerve or radial nerve or in the ulnar nerve. We have also visceromotor innervation. Visceromotor innervation is needed for functioning uh, the glands and, uh, and uh, uh, innervation of the smooth muscle cells. And in this case, we have also a multipolar nerve cell in the central nervous system, and the axon goes out to a ganglion. And ganglion is a, a group of nerve cells in the periphery. And in this ganglion, we have multipolar nerve cells these preganglionic fiber synapses with these nerve cells, and the axon will reach the muscle cells or the gland. This is here an autonomic ganglion. You will have a slide like this in the semester. The sensory innervation starts with a receptor on the periphery. And from the receptor, the information travels in the direction of the central nervous system through the peripheral process of the pseudo-unipolar nerve cell, which is sitting in a sensory ganglion, and the central process of the very same cell will enter the central nervous system, and the information is further processed. That you will learn about in the third semester of your studies in the Department of Anatomy. Uh, you will also see this ganglion, or already so, this ganglion in uh, the semester in one of the labs. This is the sensory uh, ganglion here. Now, uh, in the next uh, pictures, I will show you uh, examples of the slides, uh, what you saw in the previous semester during the labs. And uh, I could adv advise you to stop listening to my lecture here and go to the PDF file and go through the pictures and try to identify that what I show you there and make your best guess and then listen to my speech next, whether you found the right solution or not. Okay, so here you see a piece of the small intestine with a fold, and here are the intestinal villi, and we know that on the surface of the intestinal villi, this is in theory, you also have to know it, that you have a simple columnar epithelium with striated border on the surface, that is microvilli on the surface. In this villi, in the middle of this villi, you have a cell-rich connective tissue, loose connective tissue, and the cells dominate. And in the fold here, you have a very loose connective tissue with very few uh, cells, and even the fibrous elements are quite few, and a lot of amorphous ground substances here. There you see smooth muscle, and on the border of the smooth muscle layers here, we, would, we could see nerve cells. I will show you these nerve cells in a later picture. This I already explained, a transitional epithelium, connective tissue, smooth muscle bundles. And here you see the cross-section of the esophagus with the stratified squamous non-keratinizing epithelium. Again, connective tissue, smooth muscle, another connective tissue layer, two layers of smooth muscle between the two layers. Here again, you have nerve cells. And here, if you look at this band of the, uh, of the uh, epithelium, then sometimes it looks thinner and sometimes it looks so specially thick. But the truth is that this is the right thickness. Here, the Le uh, the plane of the cut went perpendicularly to the surface, so this shows you the true thickness here of the epithelium, and these territories are uh, tangential cuts, that's why it, is, uh, it appears to be thicker, but it's really just because of the plane of the cut. Here you see a respiratory epithelium, which is a pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium, you see here the line of basal bodies on the surface, the kinocelia, 
right? And here between the epithelial cells, you see occasionally lymphocytes. And we love these lymphocytes because we know that they are about five micrometer in size. And you can compare the size of the kinocilia to this. So immediately you know that they are around five micrometers. Uh, the pseudostratified columnar epithelium means uh, that all cells are in contact with the basement membrane, but not all cells reach the surface. Only those cells have uh, kinocilia on their surfaces, which reached already the surface. Soon they will die off and new cells will elongate, appear on the surface, they grow their kinocilia, they do their function. Uh, this kinocilia, they move the mucus layer, so you, it's not like a, a golf club that it hits the pieces of dust here and there, uh, but they move a film of mucus and with this, that the, the dirt that you inhale, uh, that will get out from your respiratory tract. This was the epithelium, what I showed previously, right? pseudostratified columnar ciliated. And this one is here, a stratified columnar epithelium. So you see the difference once that here you have a single layer of columnar cells on the surface. In this region, it's very well visible. Underneath, you have several other uh, layers here. Uh, but it helps also that you don't have any surface specification. On the pseudostratified columnar epithelia, we have always a surface specification, either kinocilia or stereocilia. And you will be never shown just a small piece of the slide. You see the entire surrounding. So if in this semester you saw the, uh, the stratified columnar epithelium from the male urethra, and you know that there are other things around it in the slide. So don't disregard those and try to evaluate the entire slide and learn that in the male urethra you have a stratified columnar epithelium in the spongy portion. Uh, this is a large magnification of a a stratified squamous non-keratinizing epithelium where you see the basal layer. Don't forget that in the basal layer we have always the mitotic divisions. And don't forget that very simple uh, wording of the mitosis that 26.2 and 26.4 and 26.2 and again. Uh, between the epithelial cells again you see lymphocytes. That helps us to, set, to judge the size. Plus you see here the polygonal layer and you see the stratum plano cellulare. You cannot really draw the exact borders between the layers, but altogether you see that we have plenty of layers. So this is our thickest epithelium regarding the live layers of cells. It may be around 50 layers of cells here. And you see that these flattened cells on the surface, they are very pale because they contain glycogen. All cells which don't have immediate access to nutrients, they store some food, in this case gly glycogen. And uh, the nutrition of this very thick epithelium goes through these papillae. So the capillary loops go in here and they, they have a certain limit of diffusion, right? So they can do this distance, but they couldn't do it from the basement membrane up to the surface. So these, uh, uh, these uh, intrusions of the connective tissue papillae, they allow the nutrition of this very thick uh, uh, epithelium. This is a tangential cut of the same epithelium. You see a lot of connective tissue papillae. Around the connective tissue papillae in the immediate vicinity, you always have a little a layer of basal cells, right? And then the polygonal cells, and then we move, because it's an oblique uh, tangential cut, then we move to the surface layers. Don't mix these uh, cross sections of the papillae with uh, ducts of glands, because these are not ducts of glands. These are connective tissue papillae with loose connective tissue in the middle and a capillary loop. Well, another basic type, functional type of epithelia is the glandular epithelium. Here you see serous glands, mucous glands, and the ducts. The ducts, in the cells in the ducts, they have uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm, uh, the serous glands, they have basophilic cytoplasm because they contain rough endoplasmic reticulum and they, con they secrete enzymes which are proteins. And the, mu the mucous glands, they secrete uh, mucin, mucigen, which, is, uh, a uh, which contains carbohydrate elements. Uh, so that's why these cells are so pale. Sometimes you see here serous demilunes, like here and here, uh, part of the... Of the mucous glands, they may be serous. 
Uh, also, this, for, this, for the serous glands, you rarely see the lumen because they are alveolar glands, so like little balls. You have a very little chance that you have, a, you, in the plane of the cut, you have the, uh, the lumen. And the mucous glands, these are tubular alveolar glands, so they would be like this, like tube, and at the end it dilates, and it has a little bit wider lumen, and it's all the same in which direction you cut it. You always will have uh, the lumen in the plane of the cut, so you everywhere see it here. This is, again, a detail of the lining of the male urethra, where you see here the stratified columnar epithelium, and you see these multicellular intraepithelial glands on the other side. This one is in the typical plane. Right? So this is what would appear in a textbook, and this is what we would draw for you to show that how an intraepithelial multic multicellular uh, gland looks like. Uh, the, the epithelium becomes simple, and the cells have more cytoplasm. They have more cytoplasm because they have to do this, the job of secretion. And the other three ones, these are kind of tangential cuts. And uh, you always have to calculate when you, when you see a real slide, uh, even if it's a scan slide, you may have the atypical appearance of the structures, what you learn with the typical pictures. Think about the uh, picture of an apple. So if you would have to explain to a child how an apple looks like, you would take this picture or this picture. But if you slice an apple, then you have all these other pictures also. And these are the atypical cuts. So all this may appear uh, in, in the real slides where we don't select that what is in it and we get, we get what we get during our histological process. Now, uh, this enlarged uh, picture, this comes from a detail of this uh, subcutaneous connective tissue of the skin of the palm. So here you see a stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, the dermis, uh, which is a dense irregular connective tissue. Here you saw sweat glands, and in the depth here, this is fat tissue, even as a piece of smooth, uh, of skeletal muscle, pardon, skeletal muscle is here in the depth. And if I take a pick, a territory from here, then we would see here fat cells. We know that these are around 100 micrometer, and this fat, droplets are, uh, are separated from each other, fat, fat pads pieces are separated from each other uh, with connective tissue strands. So here you see a dense connective tissue, it's also quite regular, parallelly running connective tissue, fibrous collagen fibers, and here these narrow thin cells, these are the fibrocytes. You also see dense collagenous connective tissue here, but in this case, this is now the perichondrium, the fibrous layer of the perichondrium, then you have the chondrogenic layer, and from here then the new chondrocytes differentiate, they will enlarge, they will multiply and form then the isogenous groups. Uh, this is also a tradition that when we first show you the hyaline cartilage, we show it to you from the respiratory tract. Although in other regions where we have hyaline cartilage, like on articular surfaces or in the epiphyseal uh, regions of, of a growing bone, uh, the hyaline cartilage doesn't exactly look the same. So I advise you to check the, the, uh, the chondral ossification, epiphyseal territory where the resting cartilage is, and you will see that it looks a little bit different. It's similar in that sense that we have sm smaller groups on cell of cells and that we have this homogeneous ma uh, matrix where we don't see the fibers because of the refractive index being the same as the uh, ground substance, but the cells, uh, the chondrons, will look a little bit different. And the other interesting thing is with the, with the cartilage in the respiratory tract is that it's, it looks like this only until the end of the teenage years. At, at the end of the teenage years, it will start to get calcified and even it may ossify then later in your life. And that's a normal process, so it's not, not pathological. It has to do also with the sizes of these cartilages that, uh, they, you know, that in the cartilage, in the hyaline cartilage, we don't have blood vessels, and it has to be fed with nutrition. And if it's already too big, this piece of cartilage, then it will start to have problems with nutrition. So this is an H and E staining of the hyaline cartilage here. And this was the slide what you saw uh, during your classes. You have also here the perichondrium. You have here the chondrons, right? You have this 
pass positive uh, matrix because uh, the, the intracellular matrix of the hyaline cartilage contains a lot of carbohydrates. And here you also see glands. These are here the serous glands. These are here the mucous glands. Now you do not see the lumen because it's filled with, with the mucigen. And observe please that here around the serous glands you have this sharp pink or magenta line. This is the pass positive basement membrane. Right? You can see it very well. And to compare the hyaline cartilage with the elastic cartilage, you have the possibility to look at the slide from the epiglottis, which originally you saw for demonstrating the respiratory epithelium. But in the depth, you have these amoeboid forms of the, of the elastic cartilage, and there you see this fine meshwork in the intercellular matrix, because the elastic cartilage doesn't only col contain collagen type 2 fibers, it contains also elastic fibers. And elastic fibers are not masked, masked by, by the amorphous ground substance. This is an example only for showing that the, the hyaline cartilage may start to calcify. So here you see already signs of calcification. That's also here the perichondrium. And this is already more calcified and even bony trabecles will appear right here, osteocytes. This is only just an example in this semester. You will see this in the second semester in the larynx slide, what we have. Uh, it's a beautiful larynx slide, just the cartilage is already not a uh, uh, hyaline cartilage as what you expect to be. Here you see fat cells, and between the fat cells, this cell-rich connective tissue, that's red bone marrow. Connective and supportive tissues, like in the supportive tissue, we have besides the cartilage also the bone. Please note that with the bone, you have two basic types of bones, right? You have the woven bone, that's a transitional form during uh, growth and during uh, uh, regeneration of the bone after a fracture. Then for a short period, you have woven bone, and that will be, be rebuilt to lamellar bone. And the lamellar bone has two subgroups. It's the compact bone, from that we made this ground bone, and we have the spongy bone, uh, where between the bony trabecles, uh, in earlier age you have red bone marrow, later you will have yellow uh, bone marrow. So here you see the osteons, in the middle of the osteons you have the haversion canal. The haversion canal drives the blood vessels and also nerves uh, to supply uh, these osteons. And around the Osteon, uh, around the Haversion canal, you have the uh, special lamellae, right? And between the special lamellae, there are the osteocytes squeezed in. Of course, these are only here the spots where the osteocytes were earlier, because this is a ground bone, right? But it exactly shows you the shape, what the osteocytes were like. They are like flattened discs, and they have long processes, and these long processes are in contact with each other, with gap junctions. And from the uh, blood vessel here, through these gap junctions, uh, the materials reach the outermost layers. Now, what, does the, uh, this, what do the special lamellae consist of? Uh, like always, uh, the extracellular matrix of any connective tissue or supportive tissue, it consists of fibers and ground substance. The fibers are collagen type 1 fibers. They are spiraling in these uh, lamellae. And uh, the amorphous ground substance, that's partially the typical uh, organic molecules. And to a greater extent, it's anorganic salts. It is uh, hydroxylapatite and calcium and magnesium. These are calcium and magnesium salts. So please don't forget about the organic and anorganic part of the extracellular matrix of the bone. Both are very important for the stability. Now, this is here muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, in cross-section and in longitudinal cut. In both cases, you see that the cell nuclei are pressed to the side. This is typical for the skeletal muscle, that these are sitting on the side. And you see the transverse uh, striation. You don't always see that, and you, it's possible that you have a skeletal muscle in your slide and you don't see cross striation. You may try, if you don't see the cross striation and you think that it's a skeletal muscle, you may try to play with the light and the micrometer. Maybe you can make the cross striation visible, or it may be that it, yet it's not 
possible to make it visible because uh, the fixation was not at an optimal time point and because this cross striation is ba based on protein molecules, it's already not visible. But even then, because of the size, right, these are big profiles, around 50 to 100 micrometer, and uh, a position of the nucleus, based on these, you must be able to recognize that we, that's skeletal muscle. This is a, another appearance of the skeletal muscle. We will see this slide in the uh, neuroanatomy semester, but here you see very well that we have these lighter stripes here. These are the I bands, and these are here the A bands, and in the middle of the A bands we have the H band, which is somewhat lighter. Uh, you have to know the, the build-up of the sarcomere, and please remember that in the I bands we have only the actin filaments, and in the A bands we have both actin and myosin filaments, and only the H-band territory is a region where you have only the myosin filaments. So with this, uh, as this, with the sliding mechanisms, then these, these sarcomeres may contract, and they will cause the entire big muscle fibers to be uh, contracted. And these words which are standing here, these are you have to know the meaning of all of these, right? We have the actin and myosin filaments, they will build up the sarcomere, they will make myofibrils, these are sur surrounded by the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, and they are embedded in the sarcoplasma. We have other cell organelles, so you have to know all these about the muscle. You have to be able to go from the two micrometer, two, two and a half micrometer long sarcomere to the many centimeters long muscle fibers, so you have to be able to explain how this is built up. Maybe this drawing will help you with this, because here you see the myofibrils, which are made up from the sarcomeres, which are made from the actin and myosin filaments. You see these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, territories, this meshwork of sarcoplasmic reticulum. You also see the T-tubules, where they go in here, right here they are cross-cut, these lila little rings and they go around these myofibrils, and with this T-tubule system, it's possible to spread the depolarization immediately to the entire uh, sur surface, outer surface and inner surface of the, uh, of the skeletal uh, muscle fiber, and then the entire muscle uh, fiber can contract due to this depolarization. You have mitochondria, you have somewhere, you must have also the nuclei and so on. On the first look, this would be similar to a skeletal muscle cross-section, but look at that here, the nuclei are sometimes in the middle. They may be sometimes on the periphery also, but many times they are somewhere in the middle of the cell. Plus, here we see the red blood cells. We know that these are seven micrometer in diameter. And if you compare to these, these profiles, they may be smaller, right? A little bit bigger, even bigger and huge. Right? This big variety in size and the big variety in shape in the cross-section of this muscle, this suggests you that these, this is here uh, cardiac muscle. This is cardiac muscle cross-section. And in the longitudinal section, that's typical for the cardiac muscle, that you may find these uh, intercalated discs where the cells are are contacted to each other, so we have cell membrane, but they are contacted to each other with, uh, with uh, special junctional complexes and also gap junctions. The gap junctions function like electric synapses here between the cells, so the depolarization can run uh, through without delay through this entire meshwork of cells. And uh, that's also typical in the longitudinal cut that we have this huge cell nuclei. I'm going back for a second for the, to the previous slide because I wanted yet to tell you that this big variability in the size and shape, it's due to that, that the, uh, the cardiac muscle cells, they have an X or a Y shape, and depending where you cut these branching cells, you get smaller and larger uh, profiles. Now this is here a, a piece, a small part of a peripheral nerve. This was the entire peripheral nerve with Eisen staining and I took a small part from here, where you see here the cross-sections of the nerve fibers, and you know that the nerve fibers are the axon and the sheet around it, and the sheet may be myelin sheet or just the Schwann sheet. The thickest Schwann sheet, uh, uh, thickest myelinated axons, they may be up to 15, 20 micrometer. 
uh, in diameter. And the conduction speed is about 100 meter per secundum. So that's very, very fast, okay? We wouldn't survive if it would be just one meter per second because it would take two seconds till you realize that uh, an alligator is biting your leg, right? So then that, uh, you wouldn't survive that. Uh, so these must be very fast uh, fibers which are in contact with, which receive information from the surrounding. And uh, here you see this red layer, this is an azon stain slide, so you know that the azocarmine that stains the nuclei and the cell cytoplasm, so this is the inner cellular layer of the perichondrium, and here you have the fibrous layer, that's blue, it contains mostly collagen fibers. And all these bundles of nerve fibers surrounded always by perineurium are embedded into the epineurium here around. In this slide, uh, you see two peripheral nerve cross-sections. Nerve cross-sections like this may appear in any of our slides, right? You, uh, of course, the peripheral nerve, as we go more and more to the periphery, they will be, have smaller and smaller and smaller branches. So we may have very small branches, and uh, on the first look, it could be, we would say that this, is, this looks like connective tissue, but see that it has some border versus the neighboring connective tissue. Plus you see this whirlpool structure. So this whirlpool structure, this is very typical for peripheral nerves because they are obliquely cut and anyway the nerve fibers are a little bit twisted in the peripheral nerves. So this appearance is a typical peripheral nerve appearance. For me, it looks very similar to Van Gogh's pictures, these whirlpools, what he painted due to his uh, bad eye, he had glaucoma, and because of this he saw the light reflecting around the, uh, the stars, so uh, funnily. Here you see also peripheral nerve uh, longitudinal and cross-section, right? This is here a mixed salivary gland, mucus and serous alveoli, but now I wanted to show you this here and uh, this will not be a, mat a material in this semester. I just would like to explain you that here next to a salivary gland, you see a territory where you have nerve cells. You see these large cells, nucleus, nucleolus, and the satellite cells around. And this picture is very similar to that what you saw with the sensory ganglion, right? But in case you have seen nerve cells like this in the wall of an organ or next to an organ, this might not, it's impossible that this, this is a sensory ganglion. These are multipolar nerve cells. Just with H and with the normal H and D staining, we do not see the dendrites. Right? So in the H and D staining, they look very much like uh, the nerve cells what you saw in the sensory ganglion with H and D uh, staining. Here is an example uh, from that slide which, is, which we showed you for the goblet cells from the small intestine with pus staining. There we, have, we are on the border between the two muscle layers, and here you see these big nerve cells. You don't really see where the border of the cytoplasm is because that's a little bit deteriorated, but you see the nucleus clearly, three nuclei here, with the nucleolus in it. Right? These are big cells. Big cells, you don't have too much chance. One chance is the, uh, the, the nerve cell. And here we are on the border between the two muscle layers, and here you see smooth muscle, and it has, again, this pus positive contour because we know that smooth muscle cells, they have basement membrane on their surface. Well, this is only an example, again, for salivary gland. These are serous alveoli, a small duct, a large duct with uh, columnar epithelium, maybe even pseudostratified epithelium already. And here you see a nice muscular artery with the endothelial cells and with the muscle layers. Of course, we have here a thin layer of subendothelial connective tissue, but that's quite thin. We would have to enlarge the picture a lot in order to see that. This is here a detail of uh, the scar tissue, and here you see the fibroblasts in this region. Here, these are beautiful big basophilic fibroblasts secreting these thinner collagen fibers, and here you see this coarse uh, collagen fibers with these narrow cells, and these are the fibrocytes. Look at this slide with large magnification and see the difference between the active and the inactive fibroblasts. 
cell-rich connective tissue under the stratified squamous non-carotenizing epithelium of the esophagus. In this territory, you have a lot of lymphocytes. It's a lymph follicle. Pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. Here you see this cell-free layer. That's the basement membrane. You can see it also with the H and D staining. Here, mixed salivary glands and the duct. And this was the slide what you saw uh, from the epiglottis, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium. And we showed it to you with pus staining to show that the mem uh, basement membrane is pus positive and it shows very well here. Here you see these big oval cells with eccentric nuclei. These are the mast cells. Uh, this picture you may find on our internet website and these are here melanocytes in a hair follicle. These black brownish cells, these have their own pigment, so it's not stained, it's their own natural pigment. The melanin, which is a brown pigment, and you see them here very well in the, in the, at the bottom of the hair follicle. And this will be given to the, uh, to the epithelial cells of the hair follicle and with your hair it grows out and that's why your hair has a color. About the hair follicles, we will learn more in the third semester, uh, but uh, about the melanocytes you must know also in this semester. And this is a detail, again, of the, of the scar tissue slide from the epithelium here on the surface, where between the basal epithelial cells, basal layer epithelial cells, here you see these brown-black dots. These may be the processes of the melanocytes, because in, in the... In the uh, stratified squamous keratinizing epithelium, the melanocytes, the soma is actually pale, and only in the processes uh, the melanin synthesis will be, uh, will be completed, and then the melanin will be transferred to the epithelial cells. Also, you can see here these gaps between the epithelial cells. If the picture here a little bit is seen, you see these little rays. That's why this layer is called the stratum spinosum. Here you have a little shrinkage between the cells, and where the cells were originally con uh, connected to each other with desmosomes, they, they cannot separate from each other, and that makes the spiky appearance on the surface. A warning, please, that uh, you have a slide for the elastic cartilage stained with orsane from the epiglottis. And in that slide, if you examine the neighboring territories, there you find very nice blood vessels. So at the end of the semester, you learn also about the blood vessels. So go back to this Orsenstein slide and examine the blood vessels next to the elastic cartilage because you might get questions about it. So here you see two arteries, a larger and a smaller. And here you see the internal elastic membrane. That's, this is here a longitudinal cut of a vein in this case. And I wish you all the best for the exam period. And we would like to meet you personally in the next semester in the histo rooms next to the microscope. Goodbye.